Welcome to yet another episode of the Disruption Talks, where we invite top experts to discuss digital acceleration, winning strategies, innovation, and scaling products. My name is Barbara Rybicka. I'm a consulting director here at NetGuru. And today, the key topic will be crafting culture, nurturing excellence in product design. And our guest today is Robin Biggio, the head of design at FAIR, with over two decades of experience in product design. Hi, Robin. How are you today? Good. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Uh, Robin, I have to uh, start our conversation today with asking you where you are, um, because it looks uh, your background looks really, really interesting. Can you can we kick off with that? With pleasure. Yeah, I am on my uh, little sailboat that I have in Sosolito in the Bay Area, um, and I use it on the weekend to sail with my family and during the week as my uh, work from home office or work from boat office. OK, well, that 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 sounds amazing. Uh, and I mean, I think it's, uh, it's the most original office that I've seen, <laughs> definitely <laughs> the only one that we were having a live podcast from. So, uh, so really, really uh, happy to see you there. And uh, Robin, maybe um, we could kick off our conversation with uh, giving a little bit of intro about your role at FAIR, about your day-to-day -day, um, work so that uh, everybody's on the same page. And then we dive a little bit deeper into the key topic for today. Yeah, with pleasure. Yeah, so I head up the design team here at FAIR. Uh, I've been at FAIR uh, since the company was about 100 people, about five years. Um, the design team is about 55 folks, uh, half are product designers, and then we have a really strong uh, brand studio that does kind of marketing and um, uh, other, other kind of branding initiatives um, across the org, partnering with sales and go to market. And then we have a strong research team. We also have a couple of other discipline, design operations and content design on the team. And, you know, I, I lead the team across a bunch of different uh, different dimensions. Mm -hmm. My journey here has been building the team from the ground up when I joined there were about seven designers. And so we've had we've seen a okay. lot of a lot of growth. Um, and, you know, I've been I've been, as you said, I've been almost 20 years um, uh, hand, hands on designer. I actually started in industrial design and as a consultant, I worked for many years for IDEO and switched about 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago in tech um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of transitioned into you know, digital products and, and services and, and everything around it. That must have been an interesting transition as well. Um, at the end of the day, it's a design. So, so I understand uh, uh, that the, the disciplines are, are connected, obviously. And also the team that you're running currently sounds like a truly multidisciplinary uh, product design team, uh, including all of the um, fr friends when it comes to the, to, to the other disciplines or sub-disciplines. And since we're discussing uh, crafting culture today, I'm wondering what is a team culture by yourself, by Robin Biggio? Yeah, how I think about it. I mean, I think ultimately, uh, I think team cultures are the combination of the values that the team holds and operates by, and then the rituals that you build to kind of reinforce, either create or reinforce those values. Um, they are, in my mind, foundational to a team's performance and happiness and doing good work because they shape how we show up at work, how we collaborate, uh, and therefore, like the quality and, and the way that we work. Um, and so investing in it and paying attention to it feels really important. And it's, you know, such a, such a big driver for impact for a team and obviously also for happiness, retention, creativity, inspiration. Um, so those are, those are, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's how I think about uh, team culture and why I've always felt um, was such an important component of building a healthy design team. Okay, okay. It's, it's definitely one of those things that is not easy to be defined, but then it's extremely important and extremely needed when, when it comes to building uh, teams. And can you share some sort of a uh, important or defining moment in your career that uh, shaped your perspective to the perspective that you have right now that you've just shared uh, with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe, um, uh, so as, as I shared before, I spent the first eight years of my career at IDEO, and I think that's a company that traditionally has always been associated with like very strong culture, very strong values. And so the, the, the example that comes to mind, and, and I think that's where I learned the importance of it and, you know, some of the tips and tricks or the investments you need to make for it. 
um, one of the one of the episodes that comes to mind in terms of like a defining moment was um, about three years after I started uh, working at IDEO. I used to work in IDEO in Munich. Um, I moved to the IDEO London office, and it was shortly before the 2008 kind of recession. And we ended up having layoffs at the company. I, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but I feel like about half the company uh, was laid off. And to be honest, a lot of the kind of like more junior folks, as it sadly often happens, were let go. And a lot of the management team was left untouched. Um, and we, you know, the day after the layoffs, I think in, there was definitely like bad vibes at work. I think the team was feeling very demo demotivated. Where there was a lack of a, a broken trust between the kind of I was obviously a hands-on designer at the time between the design community and the leadership community, um, and it was it was pretty tough to to you know especially for a you know again a company and a culture that is really strong that is very creative very connected very playful it felt really strong uh, it felt very, it felt very hard um, and. I started to notice that one of the most broken moments or where, where the culture really came to life and how, how much it was not working was our Monday morning kind of all hands. So we used to have the, the studio when I joined was about 70 people after the day off, I think it was about 30 to 40. Um, and we would have a Monday morning meeting where the, you know, we would all get together and, you know, it was like announcements and updates and the pipeline of projects that were coming in. Um, and, it was, you know, after the layoff, it was pretty evident the kind of discontent and people were showing up late. They were kind of not paying attention. They're rolling their eyes. Um, and it, it, was, it was just like a, the, maybe the most evident moment of where like the culture felt really broken. Um, and so I gave it a lot of thought and I was, I was very junior. I had joined the company, you know, two or three years. I was like a junior industrial designer at the time. Um, but I really cared about this stuff. And I ended up asking the leadership team if I could redesign the, the the Monday morning meeting. And I don't think they had a lot to lose. And I think they also realized that um, kind of giving it back in the hands of the design community would have, would make sense and might help. And so we ended up, I, you know, I ended up kind of putting a bunch of thoughts together, getting a few people involved. And we kind of redesigned in a, in a, in a very simple way, redesigned this meeting. We decided to have uh, just different content instead of it being like a very dry announcements business uh, kind of pipeline overview. Um, we started to share inspiring design work that was happening at the company, uh, cool things to see in London at the time. We shared work in progress. And, and so we kind of had like a very different, and the, the business update was at the end. It was still there, but like the balance of the content was very different. And the other big thing, which I think actually made as much, if not more impact, is that we created a bunch of rituals. So we bought four brown betties. These are like traditional British teapots that are big and round and we bought five of them we bought an egg boiler we bought a toaster and we kind of turned this meeting into like a more traditional british like breakfast so people would arrive early make tea boil boil the eggs and um and kind of created this kind of moments of togetherness um, and i think all these kind of touch points really kind of changed the mood and changed the the way that people were showing up and um you know within a month I think that the meeting turned from something pretty dreary and dry into actually like a deep moment of connection that we were all looking forward to, that we would all show up early for. Um, and, and I think had the impact that we wanted. It was fun. You know, it was led by the community uh, and the atmosphere was very different. It really helped, I think, kind of re, you know, just like change the way that we showed up at work. And that in, in itself kind of helped kind of get us unstuck from this rut that we were in. It's a really, really uh, inspiring story, I have to say. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, what made you think that this could work uh, in an environment where the trust was broken, in an env environment where people were like silently quitting? Because I think this topic is extremely relevant these days as well, especially when, it, when we look at what happens in the tech world. I think, I don't know if it would work. Um, but I think a lot of, uh, just like in our design work, I think same with culture and org stuff, you just need to try stuff. You need to prototype things. And so that was, you know, very much my pitch to leadership was like, can I try this thing for a month? Actually, I think that was the, that was the, that was the pitch is like, I'm going to try for the next four Mondays to do things differently. Um, and, and we tried it and it worked and we kept it and then it changed again and again. And 
even if I look at our rituals at fair, uh, you know, where I have been for five years and our team has changed dramatically, nothing, you know, none of these rituals are everlasting. They all, most of them end up changing and, and, um, and iterating and, and, and yeah, and, and, and evolving. And so I did not know that they would work. I think I took very much like a prototyping mindset. Let's say, let's try something and learn from it and we'll try something else after that. Okay. Okay. So, so that leads me to, 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 to my next question. And this is a little bit more about your personal values or your personal um, ways of uh, approaching um, changes or approaching um, things in life. Um, because I'm wondering how this connects to fostering a healthy environment. You answered a little bit, but then uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think ultimately, um, ultimately, the the this idea of like values are um, like culture values are one of the reasons why I ended up. Uh, becoming a design a design leader, or so, slowly leading my team, or deciding to lead, you know, first small teams, and then ended up to having the opportunity to lead our whole team. I think because the values are because values are so important to me, and because values are so important, I think to the way that um, a team show up and performs. I always thought that the best way to do that is to kind of be in charge, um, and um, I think. Early in my career, I think because of IDEO and their strong cultural values, because of Good Eggs, which was the first startup that I worked for, that again paid a lot of attention, I took for granted that like culture and team values was something that would just come with the territory that they didn't need to be crafted, um, but discovered through other job in other companies that actually that's not very that's not at all the case, and it's something that you need to like very um, very explicitly define, work on, and create. Uh, for yourself and for your team, um, and so that, that's a little bit why I ended up kind of in the role. One of the reasons why I ended up in the role where I was, I was, you know, working for other people or working in teams where I didn't feel like the culture was right, and kind of mm -hmm. spurred me to try to lead the way in that way. Okay, okay. And were you always taking this approach of trying and breaking things? Uh, uh, do you have any? Uh, successful stories you've shared do you have any lessons learned um uh, when it comes to, to to the stories that uh, i don't know uh didn't work well or um did not meet uh, with huge <laughs> okay i'm already seeing yeah. <laughs> you're not yeah, for sure. i mean i mean i it's i feel like you learn something from everything you do and so uh, i don't know if they're necessarily failures but um mm -hmm. let me think. i mean i think in our in our time at fair uh I, I have I have one which which we can talk a little bit about uh, uh, more in depth as well. But one of our one of the one of the kind of uh, rituals and values that um, that we've instilled in our team at Fair is a sense of gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. And for a long time, um, we used to in our design old hand we would close the old hand with people giving shout outs to each other. And it, you know, and it worked really well when we were like ten people and fifteen people and even twenty people. And it was a little bit awkward. Everybody was quiet, um, and you know, you're speaking in front of everybody. But sooner or later, people would start saying like, "So and so, thank you for stepping in and helping me, whatever, you know, get my product or my design work across the finish line, and so on." And it, I was very attached to that because I thought it was this like very powerful moment as a, as a team to get together and show gratitude for each other. Um, eventually, I think you know, I the the team. Kind of made made me understand that um, it was actually it, it, could, it was actually like not for everyone, like the fact because it was very public because it required people to kind of mm -hmm. uh, speak out in front of you know what had become like a fifty person design team. People were feeling uncomfortable. People were not sharing. Introverts were both not sharing gratitude and not receiving gratitude as much because they were just the okay. the format was not working anymore. And so we ended up changing it. We created a Slack channel. Um, where we would like do the same thing, and it and it was amazing. It was a huge change. The gratitude was actually much more organic, much more. Uh, it happened much more often, much more frequent. Uh, but that was that's definitely one thing where I was very set in a way, and I was sure it was working and working well, and um, had to learn to to kind of iterate on it as it stopped working. 
Okay, this is not really about changing the uh, the method, uh, but the, uh, the the format or the platform True. Uh, on 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 um, uh, giving that uh, sort of a gratitude uh, towards towards the team. Um, and uh, what habits do you um, or practices do you believe uh, that are crucial for uh, a leader in design um, to? maintain a productive and uh, a positive vibe in the team? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, at the risk of sounding a little trite, I feel like showing up as your authentic self or vulnerably to the team um, always, mm -hmm. has always felt really important to me. Um, I I will preface it with, with, like, I think it comes quite naturally to me, so it's not something that I've had to, like, work really hard to do, uh, but I've always tried to just like be myself um you know in, in our design all hands there is i have a top of mind section at the end of the at the end of the meeting where i talk about like what's top of mind for me what i'm working on what's happening and i take those moments to share about my struggles or what's happening maybe in my personal life as well mm -hmm. um and i think it's important because to be honest i think it's actually very simple is i i've always found it much harder especially in the professional context to connect with people that are perfect that don't share their struggles. I feel like right. when you see people that are like always, you know, like they speak super eloquently, they have all the right answers, they're all buttoned up. It's just hard to feel like truly their humanity and feel like the empathy and feel like they resemble you. Um, and so I think ultimately it's about, um, it's about creating that ability to connect. Um, and, and I think it pays off in a big way. You know, I feel like I'd like to think, I'm sure it's not quite like that, but like that everybody on my team feels really comfortable giving me feedback or telling me what we should be working on, what we should not be working on. So there's a, there's a you know, it, it feels natural, it feels right, and I think there's a big payoff. I will say that in the years, I've also discovered that there is, like everything, to every strength, there is a shadow side. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I think the shadow side to be like vulnerable and open and so on is sometimes, uh, especially a, when you're leading a team, you do need to show up as the leader that gives kind of like sturdy direction and vision and confidence and telling the, telling your team that like you are full of doubts or you're struggling with X, Y, Z. Sometimes it's actually not the right idea. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually unproductive. And so I've, I've had to, it's been hard and definitely something that I continue to work on, but like figuring out what is the right balance where I can be myself and be transparent and open, but also realize that like my words carry a lot of weight. I represent not just myself, but the design leadership team. And I need to be, yeah, I need to be thoughtful about making sure that I can be myself, but also be the leader that my team needs. Um, right. And I think a big part is like, how is the company doing? How is the team doing? I think in times of growth and success, I think there's a lot more latitude to, you know, show up in the way that whatever feels most natural to me mm -hmm. and i think in times where things are harder or you know people need to be heads down or have clarity about what we're working on i never really need to change and and as i said this is something that i keep on working on it doesn't come this part doesn't come naturally to me okay well i think uh, i really appreciate that answer uh, and i think that's one of the secrets of uh, leadership um to find that uh, the balance and to, from one perspective, uh, come as a person that is empathetic and vulnerable, but then on the other side, strong and uh, that's right. That can lead by example, basically, uh, because that's at the end what uh, we everybody like from from the from the leader. Um, and um, how would you say that uh, fair approaches the cultivation of healthy? Uh, culture within uh, the design te team, which is like over 50 people you mentioned, right? Yeah. Uh, it's an easy job to 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 uh, cultivate similar um, uh, feeling about culture in such a uh, big team. A big team, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's, um, it's definitely like something, you, you know, that is on my, you know, quarterly plan. It's like one of my items is like, make sure that as a team we're, thinking about investing, involving, understanding uh, what we need to do on the kind of culture lens. Um, I have I have somebody on my team who's amazing, Sarah, who's uh, who works on design ops. Um, and so part of her job is making sure that like, you know, at the scale that we are, it makes sense to have somebody dedicated in part to like looking after the design org. And part of her job is like programming for culture. 
Um, and together with her, and in the past, even before she joined, we just spent a good amount of time. Um, we do kind of user research like you would for a product. We spend time interviewing our designers one-on-one -on -one in my skip levels or in like, sometimes we do kind of like group conversations where we don't have managers or myself um, to just make sure that we're always understanding what the team is needing um, and so that we can keep on investing in the right programs and tools. Um, one, one thing, you know, before we were chatting about, um, I was sharing how some of the rituals or things that you put in place to create and maintain culture over time, usually it changes. I think we have one thing that has been a constant for the past four years at FAIR, mm -hmm. um, which is a really fun, um, which is a really fun practice that we do, a ritual that we do, which is, we call it top five. So this is, um, it's a presentation that everybody on the team has to give when they start at FAIR and eventually you end up giving it a couple of times. And okay. it, it's the opening act to our uh, now monthly, used to be bi-weekly, used to be weekly, all team, all hands. Um, and it's basically a presentation where you get to do a top five, anything that you're interested in. It could be top five inspiration, top five recipes, top five. We've had every topic. So it's a very accessible <laughs> format um, mm -hmm. where different people on the team will present to the, to the org. Um, and usually their presentations are beautifully crafted, highly inspiring, um, and really, really powerful. Um, we had, you know, people do like four truths and one lie and kind of engage mm -hmm. in the audience. Okay. Um, I ended up doing like my five most embarrassing professional moments uh, that I've ever had, which were okay. pretty, pretty bad. Um, and I think it's, it's, so I think it's, it's been very long, very long lasting for a bunch of reasons. I think, first of all, the format, as I said, is really easy. And so even though, you know, we have researchers, we have design ops, we have all sorts of different people on our team that are, uh, you know, some of which are designers, some of which are not, everybody can figure out what is top five things that they're excited about, passionate about. Um, I think it's a moment of deep inspiration, like the variety of things that are shown from people that love scuba diving to shooting drone footage. It just is that it's like a very easy way to bring inspiration to the team and get them to think outside of like their day to day. And then maybe most importantly is a moment of like deep connection. So, you know, people are telling the, the team and sharing with the team what they're passionate about. We do this virtually on Zoom and the chat is like going wild with like right. and questions. And uh, we have all these um, like Slack sub communities that get created. Mm -hmm. top five because people discover that like, they're really into scuba diving too, or there's like really into DIY home project. And so they end up creating kind of uh, sub Slack communities. And so it's been, uh, it's been like one of the kind of consistent rituals that have really, I think, held the team together. Um, and th the last kind of unintended side benefit is that we record all of them. And so when you okay. join our team, uh, it's a really easy way to get to know your colleague. We have a long library where everybody's top five is there and it's like a really fun place to um to just like get to know your teammates and learn about everybody's passion and so that's been really a cornerstone i think of the team culture that we've we've persevered on oh, that sounds amazing that sounds like a library of uh, interesting hobbies uh for sure. the whole team and uh, is it is it difficult to maintain it or is it is it natural for you at, at this at this point I think it's very natural. I think the okay. um, it's very stressful for everybody, <laughs> including myself. So like people, especially when you join, you we don't ask you right away to do it. We usually wait, I think, a month or six weeks before we ask you to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's definitely it's definitely a little stressful, but I think it's okay. Like I think everybody understands that they it's important. It's important to give back. It's important to do your part. Um, and then all of the all of the logistics around it are very straightforward. Like. We, you know, we record the meeting on Zoom and then we have a, we use Loom for a lot of async collaboration. And, and so the library is in there and in all of the onboarding docs. So we've, we've systematized it um, where the, the kind of tactical part, operational side is very easy. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Sounds really, really interesting. And I believe that, uh, that it's, a, uh, it's a great way to actually make 
friends at work um, because you, you you look for people with uh, similar hobbies and etc. Um, I think it's especially especially now that you know uh, fair is I guess hybrid. Um, lots of people we have offices in a few in mm -hmm. a few places around you know we have an office in London and a few places around the states and Canada. Um, but my team is by and large remote, and so even though I go to the office a few times a week. And I get to see most of my team is elsewhere, and so you know another another reason why I think this top five idea has been super super powerful because as you said, it gets to it helps you just meet other people and get to know them in a deeper way. We we wrote up uh, Amy Amy uh, who's on my team Amy Henson, um, who was the original ideator of the format, um, wrote a really good blog post on. We have a we have a team blog called the Craft where. Uh, the kind of EPDD discipline write about their teams, their craft, their work, and so on. And we have a really good article that kind of explains the the history and some example videos in there. So if folks are okay. interested, and um, some of them are are funny. Okay, brilliant. I bet uh, sailing was one of your five. Uh... It wasn't actually not yet. It wasn't? Okay, <laughs> okay, there you go. And. Um, Speaking about this successful um, example of building culture, I'm wondering if if you can name or discuss any challenges as well um, that you faced at FAIR um, and how you know cultivating and building teams culture um, contributed to overcoming the, such a such a challenge. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think. Um... I think one of the one of the things that comes to mind is um, where I, I spoke before about gratitude and and maybe I'll give you the story of how that came to be. I, uh, fair, I think like most tech companies, uh, the work is really hard. Like we have long hours, we grind it out. Um, you know, we we are our team is structured. We have kind of like cross disciplinary team with product design and uh, and engineering. We have about 25 teams. Everyone is running in parallel. Uh, we try to, you know, find moments of collaboration and so on. But by and large, everybody has like their track of work, their milestones, their kind of objectives, their metrics that they're trying to move. And so it's pretty easy to grind it out and, you know, be very focused on the work day in, day out, you know, shipping, looking at your at the results of your um, of your experiments and kind of like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And right. I think ultimately I, it's, it, it can be pretty, it can be pretty, it, it can be pretty tough and thankless. Um, and especially because we're all moving really fast. I think like everybody thinks, mm -hmm. I think that we're moving the fastest of all the companies. Everybody does. Um, okay. And, uh, and so early on, I like think in our, in my first year here, so a long time ago, Elise, one of the designers on our team, was, uh, uh, you know, was pointing this out and saying that she may, you know, like, it's a little bit of like positive reinforcement. You know, we are, we also have a pretty open uh, feedback culture, you know, especially designers are very critical of each other's work. And so we're always like, you can make this better, you can make this better. Have you thought about this? You should push this part. And so I, I think Elise kind of like, when we were a tiny team, we we're less than 10 people was like, you know what, we need to we need to take a moment and acknowledge like all the amazing work that we're doing, how we're helping each other out because all those things were happening very consistently. Uh, and so, you know, it was her idea to institute this idea of like gratitude, uh, live mm -hmm. gratitude. And so I was, you know, that, that, that I was sharing before. And again, it became one of these things that I think really helped our team, um, really helped our team feel connected, feel together and, you know, acknowledge all the hard work that we're doing and acknowledge how we're helping each other. Uh, and became, you know, something that we did, you know, at the time was every week live in our all hands when our team was tiny and now is, you know, on Slack at scale. Um, but it has, you know, it's it's been a really powerful thing that was definitely designed to uh, to counteract or counterbalance kind of one of the challenges that we were facing as a team. Okay. Okay. Sounds sounds really, really, uh, really, really good as well. Um, and I'm wondering... Um, Robin, if you have a way to ensure as well um, how companies' values um, are reflected in, in the day-to-day -day, uh, work because uh, or operations and interactions uh, among people, because how you just just 
the thing that you mentioned that everybody's re getting really focused on their day to day because at the end of the day they are part of a bigger um i would say organism um that de depend on each uh, of the persons um uh, in the team obviously and there's like a huge layer of some sort of a company's um values or company's culture so um so so how this is reflected in 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 day-to-day -day work and how not to get crazy yeah it's good, yeah it's a good question i have i have like two two disparate thoughts one is um maybe a, maybe a few things one is fair as a company has always actually been really good um i think one of the reasons why i joined is that you know i remember interviewing and feeling like they really paid attention they had a lot of like organizational self-awareness i think one of the things that i've learned you know the hard way to look for when i'm interviewing for a new job is how how much does the company care about culture how it mm -hmm. operates not just doing the work but like how we do the work mm -hmm. um, and that's something that i've always found you know that I've, I've i've found has actually a huge impact on my on my happiness at work on my ability to do good work um um, on you know the lack of politics and drama um so that those are things that i've and you know as i said i learned the hardware but i've learned to like always when i when i interview i usually like get interviewed by the company you know go through all their processes mm -hmm. and then i think many people do this but at the end i'm like cool can now can i now interview you guys and i have mm -hmm. these are all the questions or the things that i want to learn about and I'd like to set up a bunch of meetings and I do kind of my own interview, which I think is really helpful for me. I think it shows to them that I'm really invested. So I've never had anyone say like, no, um, yeah. but so through that process, I, you know, early on, I, I think I discovered that FAIR had incredibly strong uh, kind of culture and, and belief in the importance of culture and internal operations and, and, and how we work and how we structure ourselves. Um, maybe one example that comes to mind is, um, when I joined the team, and again, this was the, a while ago, um, we the company had on retainer a leadership coach who would mm -hmm. help all the new leaders kind of onboard onto the company and build a relationship with their manager, which I thought, you know, for a company of 120 people was actually very um, smart and forward looking. Um, you know, if you if you think, I think it took them about six to nine months to hire the head of design. You know, whenever you hire a leader into a company, it's like it's a big search, it's a big investment, it's a big risk, and getting the wrong person on is very painful. But also making sure that that person onboards really well is really important. And so, you know, this person, her name was Shefali, helped me build my relationship with, you know, at the time I was reporting into Max, our CEO, and it was amazing. It made all the difference. You know, she coached me, and I'm sure she kind of like helped Max and really got us to like build the foundational layers until we got to a really good place of trust and could like collaborate and be each other's partners really well. So that was really good. Um, so that was one thought in terms of just like making sure that you screen and think about, look for culture and values in a company. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the other piece is, you know, the design team, we've never really articulated them, but like we have kind of our own values that we operate around. And I, in, some of them are complementary to the company values. Some of them are uh, to kind of like round them out. Uh, I think, you know, designers, uh, designers need their own set of things to make them successful, inspired, you know, to do good work, create good quality. Um, and, and so that has been, that's always been on my mind, you know, all along as I, you know, build a team, build a culture, I've always thought like which parts of their company values do we take in and do we abide by which parts do we need to kind of create a version um, for ourselves um, but at the highest level and this is early on in in kind of like the design team's journey the main way that we've made sure that like we've we've maintained or reflected the company value has been through hiring and so we've had always we we created we actually the, i think the first team i like to think we were the first team at fair who created a citizenship interview okay. and as part of our as part of our um, as part of interview process that was exclusively designed to understand the person's values um, and make sure that it was you know compatible complementary uh, additive you know you also want to be careful not to just hire the same per same type Absolutely. of people and yeah. 
um, to our own and um, and make sure that those two things and so and, and make sure that we were hiring people that felt complementary and additive to our culture that because that's one of the biggest piece we've also um, we also have a lot of silly stuff some some silly like we have slack emojis so the company has four four i think four values um that are kind of cemented that we have val we used to have value awards once a year around we have like slack emoji reactions for them and then we use them even in our performance reviews where we ask as you're giving feedback to somebody we ask them like you know of our of our values which ones uh you know does this person represent the best and give us an example so there's all, all these other ways in which we're um kind of reinforcing reinforcing the um these kind of core company values um, that are so important to us okay uh, I feel very relatable uh, to what you're saying because uh, uh, emojis is a big part of Netgrew's culture as well. And uh, some people may think it's, uh, it's minor, but it's actually uh, a great way to, to build culture in, in, remote, uh, in the remote setup. It's very, very powerful. Um, and uh, and um, uh, it's, it's funny that you're mentioning that this is a, a big part of, of your culture as well. So. Yeah, for sure. So uh, taking that into account, uh, it, when you're looking at the, uh, let's say, broader uh, design industry and how it's evolving, um, would you say that um, there are some interesting examples of, um, of how, um, uh, how the design industry is evolving in terms of establishing and maintaining healthy culture? Is there any company that you look up to uh, when it comes to that? Or that's not the way you approach it. It's a good question. I I think maybe I'll preface by saying one, you know, I work in Silicon Valley and I work in the Bay Area. I've worked here for the past, I don't know, since 2008, so a long time, 14 years. So I definitely feel like I've lost, you know, I have, I'm like, I'm in my bubble of local companies and companies that I've worked for. And for the past 10 years, I've only worked for tech. And so what I, you know, I'll say that one, I'm like definitely in my bubble. Um, and two, I do have the tendency of kind of like putting my blinders on and not looking uh, at outside trends. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe two things that come to mind, which, you know, take with a grain of salt. One is, um, I don't know, the classic example that I think about like culture is like Netflix, Mm -hmm. Maybe one, one observation is that I feel like, by and large, everybody understands that it's important, that you need to invest in it, that, you, you know, good culture yields, you know, good business outcomes, happy teams, good business outcomes. I think, I feel like, by and large, that's been established. Whether or not then companies are able to do it, they actually invest in it, you know, like one of my examples for a company that I won't talk about um, was that they talked a lot about great culture and investing in it and so on. And then when I actually worked there, I felt that maybe they did invest in it, but it was like our values were very misaligned. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but but I feel like, I feel like it's, you know, definitely more so than 10 years ago than 20 years ago. I think it's something that companies understand as important, an important piece of, um, of their success depends on it. Um, again, take it with a grain of salt because I do feel like I have my blinders on. Um, mm -hmm. I do feel like there's not, a lot of like opinionated cultures. And I think like the only example that I could think of, uh, I think the classic example is Netflix mm -hmm. uh, and which, you know, where everybody is like, we're a family, we're best friends, you know, maybe a little bit in like my vibe of like vulnerable and like going through nature. Mm -hmm. I feel like, I think the, the legend is that like Netflix culture is like, we're not a family, we're like a high performance sports yes. team. Yes. And uh, yes. you're here, you get paid really well, but you're, you're gonna, you know, you're here to do your job and kick ass and so on. And you know, even though that's not for me necessarily, mm -hmm. um, I like, I like that, um, I like that is it has a strong opinion and it has a strong point of view. Um, and I don't, I can't think of many other examples, or, or, mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, I can't think of any other examples uh, of that kind. And. I haven't spent a bunch of time reading up. I'm sure there's many, but I, I, I like that. I mean, it's the same as like in, in product design or in design or in art. Um, 
I think it's cool when people take a strong stance. I think it's helpful when people are opinionated and um, and put something forth. Um, my my feeling is that like you know when I chat to other heads of design or I interview designers or I hang out with friends from different you know moments in my career, all the companies that we work for have kind of like a generically positive, optimistic, kind culture, and which mm -hmm. is fine. And I think maybe that's, you know, we've all reverted to the mean and that's what we need to like good, do good work and, and so on. But um, just like in design, just like in like software, I like strong opinions. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what those are, but that's maybe what I, what I observe or what I miss. Okay, okay. And that's, that's a very, uh, a very interesting, um, it's very interesting that you're mentioning as well this uh, uh, Netflix culture, because indeed there's uh, more and more voices moving from um, believing that the company is your family into, into this Netflix, let's say, um, um, approach to that. And I, but I think it, it is also, um, it, it hugely in, it depends on the, um, on the interpretation because there are different sports teams uh, at the end of the day sure. and uh, uh, a lot of different ways of coaching a sports team. So at the end of the day, there's like a, another layer um, to that uh, approach or another layer to, 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 to how um, such a culture can be seen and, and built. Um, so nothing's black and white uh, when it comes to, to, to this topic. And I think, uh, I, maybe, maybe to build on that, Barbara, I also feel like there is some maybe almost like societal considerations in terms of like, you know, as an individual, what is your community? What is your what is your center of gravity? You know, beyond maybe your friends and your family. I do think that like, <laughs> I don't know, my cynical self thinks that like companies have realized is really beneficial for their success to make mm -hmm. the center of an individual's life the company and i think you know like the dark side of a really warm culture inclusive and like uh, supportive is that like you know people end up having all of their life revolves around work right, um, right. and uh, and so and so i i agree with you that like there's different approaches and I, th I think you're right that there's different people that are challenging, challenging like what is the right, right balance. And I think one one consideration is like almost like, as I said, societal, which is like, how do you want the individual to feel? How do you want them to think about work and what role work and their colleagues and the office plays in their like overall life? And um, I don't know what the right answer is, but it's definitely something that I think about myself. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, uh, the recent years changed a lot when it comes to how people work as well. Um, totally. Obviously, uh, we're living in post-epidemic times. Um, and I think that was a huge, huge, huge change for the um, um, for the working environment. And, uh, and when it comes to that, because it, it becomes an industry-wide trend in the discussions, um, uh, for instance, remote work or, or diversity. And uh, what role do you think these things play in shaping the culture of, of, of the team, of the design team specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think huge, both of them. I mean, focusing on just like uh, the remote and the diversity piece. Um, I think, I mean, we chatted a bunch of a bunch of examples about how, you know, we've had like how, how our remote, our remote teams have had to adapt rituals yeah. and you know, get to know each other, reinforce values. Um, in, in, it's funny, in some ways, well, we've had to work much harder to make sure that mm -hmm. we felt connected, that we felt like we had shared shared values um, and kind of like a coherent or consistent or unif um, unifying culture. Um, I think what I found, to, to be honest, you know, I think on one side, in, in a remote environment, it's harder. Uh, to feel connected with your with your colleagues and and so on and so I think it's important for teams to get together periodically. We um, at Fair on the design team, we for the past two years we've done a design summit where we all come together in the summer uh, for three days and we have like a lot of fun programming and, mm -hmm. and so on and just just to spend time. But the, the thing that I was going to mention, like one of the one of the pieces that I found most surprising about the remote world is that. It, it has actually made a, a bunch of the touch points. I think the Slack emoji example was a good one, but a bunch of touch points 
um, actually almost more powerful or more effective around culture. Like I think our design all hands, all hands and definitely our company all hands are much better uh, virtual than they were in person, mm -hmm. which is kind of like very in my mind counterintuitive. And, and yeah. we try at FAIR to do our company all hands maybe once a quarter in person. And it's just like not as good. Like I think because we're a distributed team, because we have people everywhere, when we're all, when you level the playing field, we're all showing up on Zoom. The mm -hmm. chat is really fun. We have a DJ. We like we. It's like a big production. is really fun and exciting, and it, it really works. So, anyways, I think back to your question. I think like remote is a big is a big piece in terms of a big consideration, and it's obviously becoming an even bigger consideration for people as they're thinking about changing jobs and where they want to work. Um, and then on the diversity piece, um, I mean, I've I I think I I learned the hard way. Uh, how important that is. And one, I, I realize it's a marathon. It's something that you need to keep on investing in. Um, and it's and and it's like the work, then the work never stops. Um, and I, I experienced very early in my career when I built my first design team at Good Eggs, very clearly like the downside or the importance of it. I kind of inadvertently had hired I think our team was about 10 people and we were all exactly the same. We all had exactly the same values. We all were there thinking about the world. Like we came from different, from similar backgrounds. We had done similar jobs before. We were, we interpreted the company mission in a very similar way. And it was great. We had the best time and we were really uh, good and, and united. And I thought we were producing good work until we hired somebody that had like a very different perspective. They came from a different world. They had a different lens on our mission and on the work to be done. And I remember when this person joined the team and started challenging a lot of our thinking, just like how much better our work became instantly. Um, mm -hmm. it was, and, was, and, and, and I think that was like so, it was just so obvious and clear just because just like the work became better and the conversations we became better. And so, you know, back to like how important it is um, just like that difference of perspective will make your your yourself and your work and your team's work so much more powerful. Okay, okay. That's an interesting take as well. But I think at the end of the day, if you ended up hiring that person, that's exactly what you were looking for uh, in a way as well. Because as you mentioned, the culture is built in the recruitment as well. So, totally. um, so, so, so there you go. And uh, when, when you're looking forward, um, what do you think uh, about uh, what emerging cultural shifts or challenges do you anticipate in, um, uh, in that will impact how product design teams uh, will basically operate and build up? I mean, I think I don't have, uh, I don't think I have any like big revelations here. I, I think my mind is very much thinking about AI and how that's going to going to change it. I, I use it in my day-to-day -day work all the time already. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I have, I spend a lot of time like writing. I re just rewrote our career ladders and, you know, ChatGPT was incredibly useful, but it's obvious. I am here. I am not the expert and I'm sure, I'm sure there's like many people out there that have stronger mm -hmm. points of views and more informed point of views, but it's, it seems pretty obvious that like it's going to dramatically change how we work. It's going to be dramatically change the shape and expertise uh, that our teams need to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think consequentially is going to change how our team is structured, how big our teams are. And therefore, I think it's going to change kind of like our culture and the culture that you need to create um, to kind of support it. I think that the, if it seems that the, the, the kind of repercussions or like the changes that are coming as more tools come out, as more designers ad adopted, as more companies integrated are, and are going to be pretty fundamental. And, and it would be, it would be naive not to think that it's going to really impact a design team and, and its shape, its culture, its values. Yeah, absolutely. AI goes mainstream. So it's a part of our lives. For um, sure. And it's funny that you're mentioning it because uh, there is one question from the audience. Uh, which is specifically on that, uh, and uh, they're asking about your thoughts on AI impact on design teams and work. Um, so you you mentioned a little bit. Um, is there anything that you that you'd like to add? Because here um, um, the person is uh, pointing out at some brands that are 
um, embracing it, then there are also some brands that are um, avoiding Gen AI mm -hmm. uh, because they want to uh, stay human um, on brand people frontiers. What's your opinion on that? Do you already have an opinion? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have an opinion. And and I think that's why, like, our, nor do we have an opinion as a fair, fair as a company or as fair as a design team. As I said, I think we're, it seems short-sighted not to, like, try it, use it, experiment with it. And so that's that's been our stance on, on the design team. But across fair is just we're, we're we're making we're making sure that you know we we try it and we understand the ways that it helps and the way that it doesn't um so i yeah we don't, we're not we're not dogmatic about it yet like mm -hmm. yes or no um on the contrary i i don't know i think there's like a lots of amazing this is this is a dumb example but like i'm not a native i'm not a native speaker um i don't and um and i you know i have I find ChatGPT incredibly helpful in my design work, in reviewing design work, like as we're figuring out different approaches to writing, you know, UX copywriting, UX strings. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's like, and you know, there's a lot of of my teammates that are not native speakers, and mm -hmm. yet you know, we usually design in English, um, and it's been really helpful. And so, there, I don't know. I think it'd be, I think it'd be short-sighted not to try it and integrate it and so on. I know that our um, brand studios are the team that works on the marketing content. Um, mm -hmm. Also, is experimenting with it. We haven't we haven't used it for anything public or real, but it's again. I think everybody is making sure that we keep on trying it so that we so that we understand its power because it's clear that that it has you know a lot of upside as well of all the worry or of all the worrisome parts as well. And I think that's the beauty of curiosity as well, that, uh, you know, we are curious enough to experiment with that and uh, check whenever it's helpful, whenever it's not. Um, so um, so thank you very much for sharing your opinion on, on, on that part as well. <laughs> and uh, Robin, it was a very, very good uh, uh, conversation. Thank you very, very much uh, for uh, coming to our podcast today. And I wish you a lovely day on the boat. <laughs> And um, and thank you again. Um, I think uh, crafting culture has been um, really, really um, underlined today on the on the podcast. So thank you very much. It was a great uh, great pleasure to chat with you, Barbara. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and take care. Bye.